Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. And the verse will be, eventually we'll put it up on the board for you, but if you want to follow along in your own uh, little Bible app that you might have on your phone or the good old book, good to bring those. You know, I wanted to speak today, being at what we're calling Holy Spirit Sunday, I wanted to continue my series of new wine. I wanted to um, speak about how the Holy Spirit was different in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. And... The, the old wine versus the new wine. And, and, you know, I thought that was just perfect. And then I felt God was really speaking in loudly that I had to speak on this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 3. And so that's where we're going this morning. This, um, this story is about uh, Peter and John, and they stop and they pray for a, uh, a beggar on the road that's lame and he is healed. And, and that's going to be our story today. Um, to give you a bit of a time frame of Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, we, we hear about Pentecost and what was happening in, in the church. Uh, Jesus rose from the grave and then he ascended and he said he would he would pour out his Holy Spirit upon us, and, and he said it this way from a, a prophecy in the, in, in, from Joel. It says in Acts 2.17, it's not on, on the screen. Uh, it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And uh, it says in verse 18, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And, and so this is what the church is coming out of. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit has been poured out and they are enjoying a time of favor with the people all around them in Acts chapter 3, 2 and 3. And uh, great favor. People are coming to Christ by the droves. Thousands are coming. And Peter and John being um, just baptized in the Holy Spirit, we don't know exactly how long it was between uh, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, but it seems like there are a lot of things going on in there. It could have been some time. Um, and so they were heading out as as many Jewish Christians would, they were heading out, they were, they were going to the temple for a regular time of prayer. And so we pick that story up in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, or walk. Verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I want to go through this passage. We're just going to leave that passage up there so you can kind of follow along. I, I kind of want to go through it three times. First of all, I want to look at this passage in a sense or the story from a natural view. A, um, you know, kind of like a, anybody else in this world, if, um, in, in the natural, would look at a situation like this uh, the natural view is this. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. And secondly, there was a crippled beggar. And he was there every day at the doors of the church or the doors of the temple uh, begging for money. And he was expecting to get something from people. That is, that is what we're looking at. And you know what? 
we've all seen them. You know, um, we've all seen them, or maybe we've tried not to see them, if I can say it that way. As we go to the stores, as we drive down Okanagan Landing Road, uh, we, we see those ones that are camped along the side of the road. We see the ones that are in front of Safeway and Overweighty and different stores, and they're, they're begging. And they're asking for money usually, sometimes food, uh, different things, but we see them there, and sometimes we wish we wouldn't see them. When we see them in the natural, sometimes our inside voice comes out. When we, when we think of it in the natural way, Sometimes we think, you know, you, you, you look at the down and out person and they're, they're sitting in front of, let's say, Safeway and they're just, you know, talk, asking people as they go by and, and we think, oh, you, you guys are such a nuisance, right? And, and, and couldn't you just clean up a little bit? Um, you're not crippled. Why are you even sitting there? Get a job, wouldn't you? Right? And we think, and in the natural, we think about these kinds of things. We, we look at them and say, you know, why don't you be more like us? Why don't you get a job? And sometimes you think, man, I remember this one guy in, in, in uh, Williams Lake. We, we would have our Toonie Tuesday at KFC. Anybody may remember that. That was a lot of years ago. And um, Toonie Tuesday, and we would we would have our family day or our family e evening, and we'd get you know all these packets of Toonie Tuesday chicken, and and we'd go home and watch a family video together. And I remember often I would go into the KFC, and there was that same man at the door, and he stunk. His clothes just emanated reek with body odor, and. And, you know, and you think, as you see these people, you think, at least, you know, somehow clean up and take a bath. Like, if you're looking to get some money from me, um, I can't even stand near you, it's so bad. And, you know, and these things go through our minds. Sometimes I think, you know, these guys, some of them are professional beggars. They stand at street corners and they get, they actually get so much money that sometimes they make more money than you and me. They... It is a good business, right? And so in the natural, we, we look at it that way. You know, I have avoided eye contact with them. I have walked around them. I have gone to a different store because they're in front of that store. I have even lied to them. You know, hey, do you have any money? Nope. Of course I do. I've even lied to them. You're caught off guard and you're... Th Anyways, I've had disgust in my heart for them in a natural, the natural man. I've sided with those who are against them. You know, I don't know if you remember this, uh, back in 2013, so six years ago, uh, my hometown, Abbotsford, and oh, they did something in Abbotsford, and I was so, I was so impressed, and I was proud. The city of Abbotsford, they had this. There was the tent city where where all the down and outs were were gathering, and you know they had a whole city there already, and and stuff, and 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 not great things were going on. Lots of drugs, lots of everything. And the city was trying to figure out, well, what do we do with these guys? And the city came up with an idea to take some truckloads of manure and dump it all over their area. And I thought, yes, what a great idea. Oh, my goodness, did the news have a heyday? The city had to apologize publicly, you know, all this kind of stuff. In the natural, we think, that's a great idea. You know, in the natural, those tent cities that we even have here, they're, they're unsightly. They, 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 they'll steal shopping carts, right? I, you know, all those shopping carts you see pushed around, I, I guarantee you they haven't asked if they could borrow them. These are all personal experiences. I'm not just talking about stuff that I've heard other people say. 
But, you know, they break into cars. They break into homes. They break into businesses. They leave needles and junk. They abuse our medical system. And they're addicted to their own medical system. In the natural, Peter and John may have walked by this lame beggar sitting at the gates of the temple for weeks, for months, maybe even for years. He may have been sitting there and sitting there. It says, our verses say that that, uh, he was brought there every day. And they probably walked past him many days. They probably even walked past him after the Holy Spirit was poured out in power in Acts chapter 2. You know, there may have been others camped in that area too at the temple, sitting in front of the doors, uh, trying to get money from people. Um, That's the natural view that we see in these scriptures when we see the beggars and they're looking to get something from you. The, The second view I want to talk about is the religious view. And so it's the same story. Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer. There's a crippled beggar there, as there, and he was there every day, and he was begging for money and expecting to get something. And in the religious view, cripples back then were not allowed in the temple. They were allowed in the outside court, uh, the court of the Gentiles, but they were not allowed in the temple. And um, the religious view of the day was if you were a cripple, it was because it was a judgment from God, right? So if you were a cripple, uh, God was slapping you down, God was judging you for some kind of sin, and and that was a prevalent thinking. Uh, There was a time, I forget which story it was, but you know, they asked, was it this man's sin or was it another, was it his parents' sin that this guy was crippled? And, uh, And Jesus said, no, neither. Right? And yet, in Exodus 20, we see the verse that says uh, the sins of the forefathers are passed down up to, up to four generations. Right? And so there is something biblical about sins being passed down from generation to generation to generation, sticking on you, and we, gotta, and, and we you know, do our best to break those kind of things. Um, I love the second part of that verse, though. You know, the sins of the forefathers are passed down to up to four generations, but it says the blessings. Let me read it this way. uh, Showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. The blessings are passed down to a thousand generations for those that love God and keep his commandments. The religion view often looks for a formula. Uh, we look for formulas to fix problems. We see this tent city happening in Vernon, and what can we do to fix the problem? Um, programs, you know, we, we go to that so that we might be able to take care of the undesirables in a way that is workable. And so often with programs, we, we lose the love. Uh, programs often start with a great heart and a great thinking, but often it ends up losing the personal connection and the love that goes along with it. Uh, when I was pastoring in Terrace, uh, I, would, I was helping with the food bank there, and, and all of the churches donated to this one food bank, and then I would go and I would help screen the people as they would come in, and, and uh, we had to screen them because many families would do the double dipping thing, right? Uh, mom and the baby would come in uh, at 11 o'clock, and she would say, yeah, we're a family of five, and and, um, and so we'd give her a family portion, uh, usually two bags of groceries. And then at one o'clock, the father would, or the husband would come in with, with one of his, you know, one of the kids and he'd say, yeah, we're a family of five. And we would try to get, you know, two more bags of groceries. And, you know, understandable. It's a, I like a good deal too. But, you know, as hundreds of people were coming through that house as we were giving them this food, you know, I look back and I think, I I didn't know one of them. I never developed a relationship with any of those guys. 
I never heard their story. I, I, I never had time to pray with them. I, 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 was, I, I was callous. You know, I would see what they were doing and, and how they're trying to double dip and things like that. And, and um, it made me a bit callous. So the religion part of us says, let's make a program so we don't have to deal with them too much and still get them food. But we don't have to know them. I remember walking out of Tim Hortons um, up in Terrace there one day, and, and there was a man that had come uh, to the door there, and he met me at the door and, and, and says, hey, you know, my family just moved to town. There's five of us. Um, my vehicle broke down, and we're hungry. And so he was begging for some money or some food. And, and the religious part of me said, hey, you know, I, I really, I, I don't have time. I'm running off to my next meeting. I don't have time for you. But tell you what, at the end of the month, there's a food bank and you can go there. In the meantime, come to our church. We're three, blo three blocks up the road. Come to our church and we have some extra groceries there that we can help tide you over. Well, the guy never showed up. And so the next day, I'm driving downtown in my van, and the same guy comes and knocks on my window at a red light, right? And, he, and I roll down my window. I'm thinking, I recognize you. You're here to tell me that, yeah, you couldn't make it yesterday, and, you know, can I come today? I didn't know what he was going to say, and, and uh, he doesn't recognize me at all. And he jumps in with a story uh, totally opposite to the story he told me the day before about who they were and, oh, he's been in, now he's been in, in town for years and uh, no vehicle broken down, but, but you know, we have, we have all these kids and we want to feed them. It, it was just, the story was quite opposite what he first told me. And, you know, the religious part of me scolded him. And, you know, I said, you're lying. So don't bother coming to the church for groceries, right? You get ticked off, the religious part of me. In our Bible story, I think Peter and John, they're kind of speaking to us about a religion view. Um, if you look at some of those verses, you can see kind of a recipe for what they're doing there, a recipe for healing. And you know, the religious view says, you know, if you do it just like they did it in these verses, the same thing should happen. Right? And so maybe we'll see in the religious view a recipe for healing. Um, how many think that there's a formula when it comes to healing? Anybody? Right? Um, a formula. You know, if you look at these verses and you say the religious view is, okay, it was three o'clock when they went to prayer. That must be a key, right? So if I want to do the same as Peter and John, I'm going to go out at 3 o'clock and I'm going to pray for people at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock is the holy hour, the anointed hour. Uh, let's do, that's the religious thinking, you know. Um, you know, let's do it like they did it, exactly. God heals at 3 o'clock, you know. Uh, I must be going to the temple, um, or it must be at the temple or the church. You know, they were going to the temple for three o'clock prayer. That's probably the key to healing. That the guy was coming close to the temple. He was coming and they were going for prayer. And so that's got to be the key to healing. Verse four says, Peter and John look straight at him. Look straight at him, right? And, and I think, yeah, yeah, that's probably part of the key to see people get healed. We need to eyeball them, right? And, um, and then he says, look at me, look at us. I, I think these are probably magic words. Um, the healing stare, maybe. Verse 6 says, then Peter said, silver or gold I, don't, uh, I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. So what other must-bees do we see in that verse? Um, we see that they didn't actually give him money. Oh, that's got to be it. That's, uh, that's when, we, when we deal with these guys, never give them money, right? That's the religious view, right? Or take him by the right hand, not the left hand, because it says they took him by the right hand and yank him to his feet. 
right? So these are all keys to proper healing, I would think, in a religious sort of view. There is one thing in those verses that we do see that is a must for healing. It's the only part of the religious recipe that is right, and it's right every time. And it's this, that healing only comes in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Healing only comes through Christ. The religious person might say, I'm just going to use that name. It's a powerful name. It's a name above all names. And, And it is a powerful name. But you know, if we're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, if we're not his disciple, if we're not empowered by his Holy Spirit, nasty things can happen if we just use his name in a religious way. In Acts chapter 19, um, you guys remember the story of the seven sons of Siva, or Sceva, or however you want to say that name. Uh, They're sons of the Jewish chief priest. And they're going about going around, they saw the disciples going around and casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they thought, hey, we can do this too. And so they went about doing the same thing, and, and uh, they get into this one situation, and they're trying to cast out the demon in the name of Christ, and they took a beating, and they barely got out with their lives. It was the religious view that they were doing. Religion says, keep people and their needs at a bit of a distance. So the last time through this story is the Holy Spirit view. And that's really what I wanted to get to. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. Crippled beggar was there every day, begging for money, expecting to get something. Peter and John were going to the temple at 3 o'clock, it was a time of the sacrifice and the time of prayer. And when they were going, when the, when the, uh, when the Christians were going to the temple, they did that regularly, um, they would go there for prayer. They wouldn't participate in the sacrifice because Jesus was the final sacrifice, but they would go for prayer. And, uh, you know, what a great thing. And as they would go for prayer... They would do it hungering for more of God. Like, wh- why do people go for prayer? Why, why do people spend time in prayer? Why do people seek God? It's, they want to know him better. And so there's, it, what we're seeing is that there's a hungering in Peter and John to get to the temple to pray. And part of that hungering is, you know, they were filled with the Holy Spirit just one chapter ago, and there's still a hungering that they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily, right? Yes, we need to uh, be baptized in the Holy Spirit like, like they talk about at Pentecost. But then there's a filling daily that we need. Daily with the Holy Spirit. Daily filled up. And so they're doing that. They're going out to the temple and they're meeting with other Christians there. They're spending time in prayer. There's also another drawing, another hungering. You know, when when these disciples would go to the temple, they wouldn't just go for prayer, but they were going because they were on a mission. They had a ministry field there. This was their family. This was their people. And they they were on mission to go out and share Jesus Christ with the people at the temple. And, and so it was not just for prayer, but it was for the mission that they were on. And, and I love Matthew 10, 7, how Jesus says um, to his disciples about how should we proclaim the message. And he says it like this, Matthew 10, 7. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. But the key words there is just as you go. You know, don't... Peter and John, you know, it was as you go to prayer. As you're walking along, you're bumping into different people. As you're going to the store, as you're doing this, as you're doing... Just how simple can the Christian walk get? As you go... 
minister in Jesus' name. As you go, just get that in your, in your, in your mind. Just as you go, you're maybe at work all week and, uh, and you have to pop out for a quick lunch somewhere. And as you go, maybe you'll bump into a beggar on the side of the road. Maybe you bump into someone else that needs some help. As you go, we minister in the name of Christ. And it's as you go, I, I really find that, that's not the religious view, that's not the natural view, it's as you go and the Holy Spirit starts tugging on your heart. I, I remember, um, I don't know if you remember the story I shared probably a couple years back, but my brother went to, I don't know, some island, um, let's say it's Fiji, and so they were on a cruise and they were walking back uh, to the cruise ship, and as they're walking back, there is this guy, he is lying on one of the, one of the benches that are there, and he's, he's sleeping. And as my brother and his wife are walking past this bench, he notices the guy there, as he's going, and he walks right by, right? He figures, yeah, whatever. The natural man just says, ah, whatever, we walk right by. And so he did that. And then God started tugging on his heart, and he had to go back. And so he went actually to the security guard that was there and says, this guy that's sleeping on the bench there, like, what's his need? Does he actually have need, or is he, you know, there just because whatever? But the guy says, yeah, this, if any of the guys around here have need, that guy has need. And so uh, my, my brother and his wife, I think they went to, a, went to a restaurant and bought a meal for the guy and brought it to him. And the guy was so amazed. The guy was so touched by that. And he says, thank you so much. You, you are a godsend. You are a, you know, and he started just praising my brother Larry. And, um, and Larry says, you know what? Don't, don't say that about me because I'm the one that walked by you. I would rather not have given you this. He says, but Jesus in me said, I need to do this. And so if you're going to thank anybody, thank Jesus for this meal. And I thought, what a great way to turn it back to our Savior, right? That it's all about him. You know, as I was reading uh, a couple weeks back, I was reading this story that we're talking about today. The first time that I read through it, I felt God spoke to my heart quite loudly about something that I needed to do. So as I'm, you know, this almost sounds religious, but it's not. As Peter and John were going to the temple, um, they pray for this lame guy and he gets healed and, and God says I, I want you to go out and every time someone asks you for some money or some food I want you to go minister to them and uh, this, this is two weeks ago right and I thought oh really I don't want to do that that's my natural man talking right and so I thought okay okay I, I, like it's, it's in my prayer time that I'm debating with God here, and, and okay, I'll do that. And uh, I think, oh my goodness, you know, I see so many of these guys at the restaurants in front of Safeway and Overweighty and downtown and all over the place, and oh, my week is just going to be crazy with, you know, talking to people like that. And, but I said, yes, okay, God, I will do that. As I go, whenever someone asks me for money, I will stop. So I, uh, I, I go to Safeway, and I'm walking in, and there's a guy there, and uh, he says, hey, could you uh, spare some money? And I said, well, what do you need? He says, well, I really, I would really love some breakfast. And I said, oh, like, so if, why don't I take you into Safeway here with me and, and buy you some breakfast? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm not allowed in there. Right, okay, so what do, you, what do you want for breakfast? He says, well, give me some cereal and some milk. And I need a bowl and a spoon, right? And uh, so I went in there and I, and I got those things and I came back out 
And I said, now before, you know, before I gave you your breakfast, um, like, what's your need? What do you really need? Like, I, I'm looking at you, and I, and I see that you're not crippled. I see that um, you seem to have, you know, some things together and stuff. Um, what do you actually need? You're not lame. You're not sick. You're not cold. You seem to be able to carry a conversation. Um, what do you really need? Do you, do you need a job? Do you need a home? Do you need, what, what do you actually need? And he says, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a place to stay. And, and so I, uh, right there and then, I, I took him by the right hand, because that's the way you do it, right? <laughs> and he was sitting down, so I yanked him up, and I gave him the eye, I stared at him. No, I didn't do any of that. I did take him by the hand and we prayed. And we just prayed that God would answer his request. Right? And, um, and so all, all these last two weeks, I've been waiting for the next person. Waiting and waiting. And I only got the one. Like, sometimes they're all over the place. And last two weeks, I only, I only get to talk to one. Um, maybe it's because I keep eyeballing them, right? I, I don't know, maybe. Um, I even went back to Safeway to see if I could find this guy again, you know, and make friends with him. Um, I, actually, I think, I, I, I kind of think now that maybe it's because I'm eyeballing him. They, they kind of walk around me. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe I freaked them out. I don't know. But now I have a Holy Spirit hunger to see if I can meet needs. And oh, the joy that comes out on the inside. I, I'm not offering them money or food usually. I'm just, I'm, I'm ready just to say, hey, I don't have any money for you, but I do have something for you. And I just want to pray with them, right? How cool would it be if everybody in this church, every time you saw a street person and they're asking you for something and you always answer, I don't have money for you, but give me your hand. And you pray for them. And everybody, everybody did that. I, 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 oh, that'd be neat to see. That'd be so neat to see. Anyways, I'm doing that. And there's a hunger that has been birthed in my heart to do that. As I go to pray with the homeless... I don't think Peter and John healed every beggar, every lame person that they saw. I don't think, I, don't, I, I think they even walked past many beggars and many lame people. You know, when I look at the story, this story, um, I think, you know, they didn't stop for everybody. They stopped when the Holy Spirit prompted them to do something. And I think that's our key. As we go and as the Holy Spirit tugs on our heart, as Jesus says, hey, I need you to be my hands right here. And it might mean, you know, we've, we've taken, we've taken a, homeless, a homeless person in for two months back in Quinell. It might mean something like that. Oh, that was awful. It might mean taking someone out for a lunch. It might mean slipping them a few dollars. But the best thing, I think, is to be able to take them by the hand and pray for them and say, and, and ask them what their real need is and ask God to do a miracle in their lives. When I look through this story and how the Holy Spirit works, I see that there's lots of prayer going on and there's and, and they're being filled daily with the holy spirit and they're on a mission as i look through the story i see that there's lots of as you go and saying holy spirit what are you doing in this situation i want to partner with you there's lots of uh each situation is different and you know programs they're good but it really it's it's when we get to know the people 
get into their lives, go the extra mile, be with them, allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. It's those things that make the difference. I know that. Yep. Yep. There is, there is a bunch in our church that are very good with reaching out to the homeless. And uh, we, we talk about it often, and I, and I share some of my stories, you know, about how callous at times I've gotten. And I, and I think God has opened up my heart more in a way now, too. One of the things that I saw in the Holy Spirit view of this story is simply this, that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the name, is the only thing, is the one that has anything really to offer. Um, you know, my, my $2 so that they can have a coffee or a, or a sandwich isn't going to go very far. My... Um, giving them a ride somewhere, yeah, it's not going to, that'll take them a few miles, but that's about it. Um, we can even pull them into our homes for a time, and, and, and that only goes so far, but when we bring them Jesus, that's what, that's what changed our lives, and that's what changes their lives. And so, really, as we go and listen to the Holy Spirit, that's when we'll be impactful. I want to close the service off this way today. Um, our Holy Spirit Sunday. We've been talking a lot in the last three months in the church here about what God is doing and how he is working. And, you know, instantly if you see someone that has some kind of sickness, we say, let's pray for healing. Or if someone is in need of finances, we say, oh God, pour out the finances on them. Or if we see someone that needs a job, God, would you supply the job? And we don't stop and wait and find out what God is actually doing in the situation. For the person that needs finances, what is God dealing with them with? Right? Is there, a, is there a bigger story that we need to hear and listen to from God so that we minister to them properly? Right? Uh, you know, uh, God, I, 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 need a, I, need, I need a million bucks. Right? And so we pray, Lord, give Cliff a million bucks. Um, he's not a genie that we, would, that we would do that. Right? But God is doing something in our lives, and I've seen it over and over and over, especially in the last three months, where someone gets a, a medical thing, and I say, God, what are you doing? And so that's where I kind of want to go with us today, and that is, I want us to wait on the Holy Spirit for a few minutes, and allow God to speak into our lives, so that we know what he wants to do with us. You know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, some people say, oh, I, I, I can't wait because I want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's going to happen on the Holy Spirit Sunday. Or another person says, hey, uh, you know, gifts, uh, supernatural gifts are poured out. Uh, maybe that'll happen to me on the Holy Spirit Sunday. Or maybe, you know, and, and whatever it might be, you might have preconceived ideas of what you want from God today. But what we want to do is we want to wait on the Holy Spirit and let him do something in your heart and your life on his agenda. Not what we want, what he wants for us, which is fantastically better than what we would want. So, um, you know, I'm not a hype person. And in fact, I don't enjoy hype that much. Um, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna play a play a song and, and and get you, you know, into the mood of prayer. We're just gonna go, in a sense, to prayer, uh, not even talking to God, just waiting on God. And so, 
if we could do that now, what I want to do is I'm going to have you all stand, and then I'm just going to pray a quick, quick prayer, and I want you to wait silently before God. <laughs> no, there's, you know, there's no magic number, but we're going to wait for about five minutes silently before God. And just allow God to do what he wants to do in our lives. Right? You might hear from him. He might speak into your life. He might point out some things in your life that you um, might need to deal with. He might give you a vision for the future. He might, there's so many things that the Holy Spirit will do. I uh, can't even begin saying them all. Well, whatever he wants to do is what we want him to do this morning. So why don't we do that now? Would you stand with me? And then I'm going I'm to pray a prayer, and then we're going to just wait in silence for about five minutes. After that five minutes, I have asked my prayer team to, um, for those that would want extra prayer, uh, to go around and pray for people. And I've actually moved the pews apart. I don't know if you've noticed that this morning. They're a little wider apart so that some of these prayer teams can just come in where you are and, and pray for you. They're not going to do anything weird with you, right? They're just going to ask God to, to do things. Uh, they're probably going to ask you, you know, is there something special you would desire for God to do? They, they might even ask you, hey, in this five minutes, did God speak to you about an area? Let's pray about that. Right? And so we just want to wait on God and, and, and see what he has to say, and we'll go from there. So um, just everybody close your eyes. And in fact, um, you know, the Bible tells us to lift up holy hands in prayer. Uh, we, we, we do that in, in a way to just say, God, I'm open to you. And so maybe if you're comfortable doing that this morning, why don't you just raise your hands and say, and we're, I'm just going to pray now. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place, we invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us now and do something in our lives. Holy Spirit, come.
want to invite the worship team to come and uh, prayer team. Uh, if you want prayer this morning, maybe you felt that God spoke to you and you don't want prayer about that, or maybe it's about something else. The prayer team wants to come around. If you want prayer, remain standing and they will come to you and, and pray with you.